Roof lines. This is roof lines. Today I have Mr. Justin Bourne, a very good friend of mine, joining me, who is an estimator for yes, absolute roofing and waterproofing here in Austin. Has a couple of offices, I think uh, Dallas, Austin, where else? Uh, we're in Louisville and Austin. Those are our main offices. Okay, Louisville and Austin. So we're bringing to you today estimating, and that's what we're going to talk about is not just you can't just look at a, a roof plan and do the square footage and and think that you have everything that you need for a, a good estimate correct and we're talking we're really talking new construction anything with plans and specs or uh, like a school job that's going to be a re-roof and you're going to have your specification and your plan and a whole bunch of details so that's what we're talking about we're not talking about you know commercial re-roof where you're up on the roof and you're you're measuring it out we're actually talking about blueprints correct correct i mean we're not talking about here's this many square feet we've got fifty thousand square feet and we're going to use six hundred and five dollars a square foot that's not going to cut it you mean just it's, throwing out a yeah, number you like you can just throw a price per square like you could if you're maybe a shingle mm -hmm. roofer there's a whole lot more to it there's there's so, details the devil's in the details and if you mess up the details you mess up the project and it goes from profitable to not and so i always tell my friends my residential guys even the guys that are just breaking into commercial starting out with with roofing the biggest difference between commercial and residential is liability because mm -hmm. the bigger mistakes happen on commercial roofing the 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 when you miss something completely in a set of plans, but let, let's let's talk about you first. Your mm -hmm. lead estimator over at Absolute. Mm -hmm. um, where did you where did you learn how to? I mean, because you're you're he's pretty incredible. I mean, you're you're pretty <laughs> spot on. I mean, it takes you're you too kind, Jay. <laughs> so where did where did you learn how to estimate? So I essentially I went to college for construction. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my dad was a roofer when I was younger. He was a, a door knocking hail chaser type roofer. Uh, I went into construction, uh, wanted to build some big projects. I, uh, construction is always something I enjoy doing. So, you know, once I got my degree in construction, I pursued general contracting as uh, as an estimator in their pre-con department, and did that for a while because I knew I went to college to use my brain instead of my back. Hmm. I want to kind of in this for the long haul. Uh, so, where'd I, you go to school? Texas State. Okay, very San nice. Marcos. Mm -hmm. Was it was it Southwest then, or it was yeah. Texas, Texas? State? It was Southwest Texas yeah. for my first couple of years, but then I graduated at Texas State University. They changed it, I believe, in two thousand three or four. Right? Was it the six year plan, like five. some of my friends? Five. Yeah, there you go, five year plan. <laughs> it's yeah, a fun yeah. place. If you've been to San Marcos, you understand. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so where? So you were you you went to college for it? You worked with your dad for it, but mm -hmm. then where else? Where did you land? Uh, uh, I landed at McCarthy Building Companies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I started my career out of college. You know, we worked. Uh, I worked in the pre-con department. We did a lot of stuff with hospitals and schools and uh, big projects for the most part. Really interesting, fun stuff. And I was generally in charge of between eight and ten trades per bid on a single project. Um, and then, you know, I kind of got an overall view of all all CSI codes other than MEP. I got well versed in everything from dirt work to uh, you know, roofing, specialties, concrete, masonry, steel, the whole nine yards. And okay. eventually I decided instead of being a jack of all trades that I would like to be a master of one. Right on. And that's when I met, uh, or I didn't meet them. I'd known them for a long time, but I met Dustin Guest back in high school a long time ago. And I had been estimating. A long, long time ago. Yeah, a long time. 20 plus years ago I met Dustin <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And, uh, you know, he talked about bringing me over from the GC department to becoming a subcontractor. And, you know, I enjoyed being a GC, but the la the hours were long. Mm -hmm. uh, the appreciation was very little. And, you know, one of my best buddies asked if I'd join his team. And I said, sure. It made sense. As, as long as I got more kids now, so I don't want to be the 60 plus hour a week kind of guy. Right, exactly. At least gone 60 hours a week, I should clarify. Right, so, right, right. You know, when you get into the subcontracting world, you can work at home quite a bit at night. Absolutely, absolutely. So. So, uh, and I'm sorry to, to cut mm -hmm. you off, but uh, typically the, the jobs that you're estimating now, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what size, price, difficulty, what, what, are you, what are you typically looking at going after? Um, well, you know, we've, we've evolved over time since we first started. You know, I, we were originally trying to get our feet in the door, so we were doing smaller, less risky jobs. I'm a very risk averse person to begin with. 
And so the, dollar, the higher dollar values uh, made me nervous at first until I really knew what we were doing mm -hmm. because I kinda, we kind of taught ourselves how to do things. You know, it wasn't, we didn't have somebody teaching, I didn't have anybody teaching me to do things. Right. I kind of just figured it out because I knew how to read specs and, you, you know, go. through making mistakes uh, over time, you know, you make a mistake, you shouldn't make it again. And I've learned from every single one of them. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we started. I started out chasing some smaller stuff like banks and restaurants and little deals like that. And, uh, and that, that would actually be where I tell all of my, my guys, I'm like, start small. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going from residential to commercial, let's start with the small stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, let's, let's dive into the specs because they're not as intense as a much larger project like a school or and hospital. Just, and just because it is smaller in value, you know, your forty to sixty thousand dollar roof range, including all your metal fabrications and the entire system, you still have every single part and component that you would mm -hmm. on a one million dollar roof. You still have on the sixty thousand dollar roof. But your risk uh, is much less because if you make a mistake on something that small, you cost yourself a couple grand. You make a mistake on something that large, cost yourself a lot. A couple hundred grand. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. how, do, how long does it usually take for you to estimate the jobs that you're going after? You know, typically the bigger, the bigger ones. Most of the ones that I, it, the, most of the schools I chase after probably the 12 to 18 man hours per okay. each estimate. Okay. That includes my takeoff, my, you know, compiling the spreadsheet itself, typing the proposal, you know, calling my, distribu uh, my distributors and getting, you know, firm pricing on my big ticket items. You know, accessories pretty much don't change in price, but the big dollar items, they do. They can vary wildly from a 200 square job to a 900 square so, job. So you said 12 to 18 hours, 18 man hours, that's sitting there in front of the computer, measuring everything up, looking at all of the mm -hmm. different parts and pieces that go into the roof, reading through the specs. That's, that's, a, lot, that's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a long time that you really need to put into that that bid. You mm -hmm. can't just go there, digitize it, or with you know your scale, get the square footage. And once again, like you said, you just can't throw a number at it. Six oh five a square. Call the distributor. Hey, you know, I mean, this is what I'm bidding. Do you think I'm safe at six hundred? Mm -hmm. Do you think I'm safe at seven hundred? Without doing your due, due diligence. diligence of twelve to eighteen hours of really combing over all mm -hmm. of the specs, all of the details, every single page mm -hmm. in that. In, in that uh, and even even on a small job, if I was blowing and going, and let's say I, you know, one of my main GC clients was like, "Hey, can you knock out this small job for us?" You know, because we want you guys to do it. Even on a small job, I'm spending six mm -hmm. at a minimum, and you know, there's a process to doing everything because it's important not to miss. It is in the details. What is the biggest item that you've ever missed Ooh. on a job that yeah. you, of course, learned from, but? Yeah. Uh, an entire building at an apartment complex. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I did that with garages. Yeah, I missed all that's of the exactly. garages. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That happens. And yeah. that hurt. I yeah. mean, that ate my lunch. Or you look at the you know the plans and it's garage A and garage B and you know it looks like there's one of each, but there might be three garage A's. Right. So another another quick story that big mistake that I made is um and I don't know if you do this. I'm sure that you do. So. I learned very early that you look at the foundation uh, because the foundation has all the measurements on it. And the roof plan sometimes does not have measurements. And the architect had put the scale at, uh, you know, on the roof plan at one quarter and it was supposed to be one eighth or, mm -hmm. or vice versa. It was half the size when I measured it and I didn't look at the, the, uh, the foundation to look at the square footage. Mm -hmm. And it was a tile roof, it was a clubhouse. Uh, luckily, I was able to point that out and say, look, your scale's wrong. And so they paid me the, uh, the other amount to get the other half of the roof done. And that was a very kind individual that would do that because most of them may just hold your feet to it. And oh, absolutely. I've made the, the incorrect scale mistake myself, and I always double check the scale every single time, no matter what. If it says an eighth, a sixteenth, three eighths, doesn't matter. I find a known dimension. There you go. A known dimension from a previous floor because sometimes... Uh, a lot of times the roof plan doesn't include grid line. So typically if you look at a set of plans, you know, you're numbered one through nine going up and down across the bottom and then A through H going across the top or vice versa, whatever the, depends on the architect. Right. But they'll say at a 16th or an eighth scale. And, um, 
I've found that to be incorrect maybe 5% of the time. Oh, yeah. Pretty frequently that that happens. It's an easy mistake to miss. And it's so ingrained in me now that I double check it every single time without fail. So what is the first thing that you look at when you open up a, a set of plans that have been sent to you? Because no, nobody really drops off blueprints anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the paper ones that, you know, you, the, the, it's printed on a, uh, on a plotter. Mm -hmm. Um, even 24 though, by 36, big old sheet of paper. Right, exactly. Even though some, some contractors, they still have a plotter in their office so that they can run off the plans and make notes on there. But that's totally old school mm -hmm. to actually measure with a scale, you know, a wooden scale or a triangle, whatever you want to call it, even the roller one on that plan. So when you open up the file, what is the first thing that you look at? Well, usually, so I get, I get bid solicitations uh, from online services like an I-square-foot or a Building Connected or a, a Smart Bid, one of those type of bid solicitation services. The GC will usually include maybe a paragraph synopsis of what the project is. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at you know, a 20,000 square foot restaurant? Are we looking at an, you know, an 80,000 square foot school? Are we looking at... 200,000 square foot tilt wall okay. warehouse. So I like to read the description, see what I'm looking at. Is it a renovation? What are we talking about here? Is it a taxable job? Is it a non-taxable job? Mm -hmm. Eight and a quarter percent will win or lose you the job or put you upside down easily. Oh yeah, so the, the eight and a quarter, like if it's taxable, mm -hmm. are you sticking that on the entire ticket or are there no, material rules? Only, and, yeah. Exactly. It's material only. So I like to get the bird's eye view of the project first. What's their description? Usually they don't spend a lot of time on it, but it gives you a general idea. Then I download complete set, all my architecturals, uh, every single sheet, not just a lot of mis people will make mistakes where they just download the roof plan, the wall sections, the mm -hmm. building sections, the elevations. Mm -hmm. They may forget the RCP details. Do you have soffit plumbing? RCP, what's oh, RCP? That means uh, reflected ceiling plan. Mm -hmm. Now uh, I and don't- And then maybe garages also, garages the last page. Too. You wouldn't know that unless you downloaded the site plan. Would yeah. a roofer download a site plan on the regular? He should, because if you're looking at a multifamily apartment complex, you might want to get a grasp of uh, the overall site of the project. You look at, you know, where are my temporary, you know, my potential lay down areas? Where can Staging. I store material? Mm -hmm. How am I going to stage it? Um, those types of things. So and then, and then also, uh, how about plumbing? and HVAC so that you can see what's on the roof. Right, I will. I don't download the complete set of MEP plans, but I do download the mechanical plumbing and electrical roof plan if they have one. Sometimes they combine mechanical and plumbing, mm -hmm. but usually you have uh, all three and that you can compare the roof penetrations because a lot of times the architects may just show a handful of RTUs, but in reality, there's 40 up there. Oh, and yeah. if you didn't look at the MEP plan, you're 15 uh, RTUs short, which is, you know, additional membrane, additional corners, additional turn bar, additional detail work. Additional labor, additional mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not as wide open as you thought it might have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much profit if you missed that for sure. Mm -hmm. So now when you downloaded all those, you looked at the plans, you get kind of a feel for it. Mm -hmm. when, do you, when do you crack open those specs? Uh, okay, so after I get the bird's eye view of the project, because I think it's important to, to understand the forest before you try to figure out all the individual trees. You, know, you mm -hmm. wanna get an overall scope because that just helps me get a better idea about what I'm looking at. <clears throat> and then I'll go into the spec. Is this, and, and it's important to read that because every single building is different. Every single attachment method is different. Every single condition, you may think it's the same, but I've built roofs or buildings for the exact same general contractor and the exact same owner that are completely different. Mm -hmm. The spec is completely different. So I mean, do you start with page one? Or do you jump to Division 7, or do you even look at... So I do. I start in the table of contents, mm -hmm. uh, Division 0. I look at, uh, you know, what's my overall scope? What, what, am I looking at, you know, PVC? Am I looking at TPO? Am I looking at key? Am I looking at fleece back? Am I looking at a modified system, uh, torch down, APP system, SDS system? What are we looking at? So I get my table of contents. That gives me an overall grasp. I also pick up things like, you know, is there a standing seam metal roof? Do they have a spec for that? Yes or no. Do they have wall panels? Do they have a spec for that? Mm -hmm. Do they have sometimes um, the architect will include the roofing assembly in the 0722 spec, which is building insulation. That's not very common. In fact, I took off one today that had that. Usually I find the assembly information in the single ply spec itself. Right. 
but sometimes, not to name any names, but some architects put it in a completely different spec. And if you don't review that table of contents, you might miss that. And, um, and I don't know if you've ever seen this happen before, but the spec's going to say single ply and the plans say modified. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that instance? Or one says TPO and one says PVC. So which one takes well, precedence? If, is if it it's the spec so, or is it the plan? Which one takes precedence for you? Well, it depends on the, if you're talking about modified versus single ply, that's two completely different systems. So I'm picking up the phone immediately and calling the general contractor and saying, what are we really looking at here? But then if there's, you know, conflicting specs versus details on a single ply system, for instance, the spec might say to mechanically fasten the assembly, but then you look at the spec and, and me mechanically fasten 60 mil assembly. And then you look at the plans and all the details are uh, a fully adhered system mm -hmm. with 80 mil PVC. Mm -hmm. That doesn't add up. So essentially, I look at it, if I can't make the call in time or get the answer or get an answer from the general contractor, I, since I'm risk averse, I bid the more expensive system every so, time. So it's always the pecking order. You, you go to the GC. Mm -hmm. You don't pick up the phone and call the architect. Absolutely not. Yeah. Why, why would you not do that? Well, some GCs might uh, not like that because mm -hmm. then you're essentially stepping out, if you're in the military, stepping out of your chain of command. Absolutely. By, you know, they... Not following the pecking order. Like, what, what if it's what if it's a manufacturer you have a very good relationship with and they're not listed in the specification? What what, what do you do then? How, how do you... So if I'm bidding a project and I see Versco is not listed in the spec, but they have all those other manufacturers in the spec, uh, I will reference, usually it's 012500, which is your substitution request mm. uh, forms, and that tells you how to get a different of equal value manufacturer in its, in its stead. If it's a public job, they can't have a, a closed spec. Meaning, if it's a public job like, let's say, a school, school or prison. a publicly funded mm -hmm. university or mm -hmm. a prison or a state hospital or a police station. I've been in all four of those, by the yeah. way. <laughs> any of those, uh, any of those types of jobs, mm -hmm. you know, is a public project, and in a public project, uh, you can't close the spec. So, so you had mentioned a certain part of the specification where you go to find out the procedure mm -hmm. for a substitution. What was that section again? O one twenty five zero zero, and it's very specific because if you just decide very to, specific. yeah, if you just decide to turn in Versico because you want to. And that 0125 said substitution requests must be made in advance. If you recall, Jay, I sent you one maybe last week or the week before to get the uh, substitution request handled up for us. So we were able to bid Versco in lieu of the other manufacturers. Right. But a spec, if you, you want to talk about the diagnostic, you know, what is in a specification, they're all in three, it's in three sections. So if you're talking about a single, single ply, you know, it could be 0754, 23, or you know, they all change the numbers between, it's usually 07, 54, and a couple numbers. Depending on the architect, they may vary a little bit between TPO, single ply, et cetera. But it's in about that range. Now, section one of the spec is uh, has to do with warranty information, code information, upload uplift requirements, um, things like that, submittal requirements. What are they looking for? Just a complete package of documents. Do they want samples? Is there going to be uh, a 12 inch by 12 inch sign required showing the, uh, the warranty information at a visible location, that types of stuff, your overall system and basically code type stuff. Is now that, a, that, that affects your price. Does it not? I mean, everything in there. Absolutely. I mean, like, cause wind speed, uplift, mm -hmm. warranty. It has to do with your, your fasteners per board, your bead pattern, uh, for glue. Those are significant costs in any project. And it also differentiates between, uh, you know, what kind of system is it? Mm -hmm. And then your section two of the spec uh, is the products available. So your first part of it, 2.1, is usually, you know, what is a single ply manufacturer to prove? It's, you know, the others plus first go. Um, and then after that, it's, you know, what assembly is, is uh, allowed? What type of ISO is it? Is it class one or type one ISO? Is it type two, type three? Well, you, know, you can speak to all the different types of ISO. And, mm -hmm. and, oh, know. yeah. That's why we have a cheat sheet that you can just look at. Mm -hmm. You know, just go straight to it whenever it start, starts talking that gibberish. Mm -hmm. You can actually, you know, decode what it is. So what advice would you give for any any of the audience that's uh, that's jumping into this, that uh, hasn't been doing it for that long, or, or that's just, just starting out? 
What, what's what's your biggest piece of advice uh, uh, go, going into you know bidding commercial new construction? Learning the system, paying attention to details. You need to know what the system is, and they're they're all different. Everyone's different. It's but as long as you pay attention, follow what you're doing. You know, maybe uh, do look at some of Versco's online training. How do you heat well the scene? What does details look like? Because Versco has all that information on site if you need it o on their website. You know, what does a, a base tie-in detail look like? What does a, a roof davit detail look like for window washing equipment? What does, you know, learn all the details. You can look at, uh, I'm sure you have installation videos online, but you can also look at installation videos on, you know, other services like YouTube or something, how to, how to put together the system, mm -hmm. how to put the screws down, what patterns you do. Uh, B patterns, all those things, kind of really know what you're looking at before you jump into it. So wouldn't another good piece of advice be, let's let's start out with re-roof where you can actually get up there and look and see what all is up there. Mm -hmm. So then you can see all the different, uh, the nomenclature that goes with everything that's on the roof and then look at some specifications and, you know, line them up and then dive into Dive into the new construction also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it's really not that complicated. It, everything goes down in layers. There you go. But you got to put the layers in the right order. Got to be in the right order. And you got to put the layers down the way that they want them put down. If mm -hmm. the first layer is screwed, you screw the first layer down. And if all subsequent layers are adhered, you need to glue all the subsequent layers. Just because you want to screw down the assembly and glue the membrane or, or whatnot doesn't mean that's what the architect wants. It also doesn't. You know, the system that you may want to do that's cheaper and faster and better is different than what the architect specified. Now, they did that for a reason. Now, it's not our call to make on whether or not to screw it down or glue it down. Mm -hmm. It's also not our call to make to change up their system because here's what's going to happen. You, change, you decide to take a fully adhered spec, mechanically fasten everything, you're all of a sudden significantly lower than the rest of your competition. Mm -hmm. You go to contract and submit a process, you're not turning in the right system. Um, Everybody's going to be mad about it. Nobody's going to be happy. Everybody gets egg on their face. The GC used your number, which was too low to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. So now the GC is asking the owner and the architect for more money. The architect's mad at you because you put the wrong system in. Mm -hmm. And you thought you were doing a good thing by being low. Um, when, you know, you need to follow what that, what the design intent is. We're not the designers. We're the installers. We can offer advice, uh, but... Um, you know, that's not our call to make. And, and, and I'm also seeing now uh, a lot more jobs uh, going bonded, even mm -hmm. apartment complexes. Mm -hmm. um, so be very, very careful of that because a bond, that could be a, a personal bond, correct? It could be. You've got, there's two different types of bonds. There's the payment and performance bond, which you would have and to make sure that you're able to complete the project. But some larger public projects might require a bid bond. And a bid bond might require 5% for you to pull out. And if you pull out of a four hundred thousand dollar job times five percent, that's twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Yep. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining me. My pleasure. Uh, roof lines. Make sure if you uh, have any questions. I mean, is it okay to reach out to yeah, you? Absolutely, uh, anytime. Yeah. yeah, check out our website, uh, absoluteroofpx.net. Uh, You're on Facebook page. also, right? Yeah, Instagram. We have, a, we have a Facebook page. We post a lot of uh, photographs of our ongoing pro uh, projects and little things like that and uh, you know we'd be be happy to help as a mentor mentee program absolutely I mean that, that's what we're here for guys is just to help you on your journey in this crazy world of roofing we love it uh, I love it been in it 26 years uh, yeah. and, and it's just be because of uh, friends like this that, that like to help out so guys thanks for joining us roof lines make sure to like my videos uh, make sure to follow me raise the V Versco <laughs> roofing systems Karnak Cements and Coatings, Hunter Panel Poly ISO. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yes, sir.